Hi guys and welcome to another video and boy have I got a treat for you today. I feel that I come to you at really at a pivotal moment in the course of saxophone evolution and I know that sounds like quite a major statement to say but we are talking here about a brand new Selma and not just any new Selma, this is a top of the range new instrument which is going to completely set a new standard in saxophone history in my opinion. So Selma have apparently been working on this for eight years in secret and I literally only found out about this about a week ago or so uh, when the information was revealed to me by my uh, Selma rep and I kind of got the feeling that they were working on something special in the background but to be honest I've totally forgotten about it and when it was revealed in this sort of email send out I was really blown away with the concept of, of what they were trying to achieve and, and the possibilities that this would potentially bring us. And literally just a few days later, our first Supreme arrived and I'm so excited to be playing this right now for you guys. So yes, as I say, this has been eight years in the making. Um, the idea is that Selma, all those years ago, decided that they wanted to produce an ultimate instrument that really they would sort of see as a universal instrument that spans across all of the styles, so from classical to jazz and anything in between. And in order to achieve this, what they first did was they consulted some of their really key artists um, where they asked them various questions on what they really like about the classic instruments that Selma have produced over the years, the characteristics, the traits that these instruments are famous for, but they wanted to hear what these traits were in the words of these top artists, as I say. So we're talking about people like Claude Delong, Vincent David, uh, Timothy McAllister, uh, Baptiste Herbin, just to name a few. I mean, there were plenty more they consulted with. So this was a, a long um, R&A process, if you like, where they, they got this information. And once they got all this information about these kind of tonal characteristics, um, they put all their ideas together in a melting pot and came out with this brief as to how the saxophone should sound. Um, clearly, if it's going to sound like all of these classic instruments that we're talking about, really from the balanced action onwards, so the balanced action, uh, the Mark VI and the Mark VII, the Super Action 80, Series 2, Series 3, and then the modern day reference from 2003, that's a lot of information and a lot of potential traits to incorporate into one single saxophone. So they certainly had their work cut out, um, but I think there'll probably be certain universal truths um, that um, relate from one instrument to another that are shared by, by the various models, if you like. So they probably had it condensed down to um, a, a manageable spec, shall we say. But certainly just that whole concept is mind blowing and very exciting. And I just sort of also feel that Selma are the, the people that have the authority to do this because it's, it's their designs. We're talking about Selma designs that go back decades here. So they have the right to, to um, go into those designs and say, look, this is what we did back in the, in the 50s. This is what we did in the 60s. And they can be true and honorable to those designs that they owned back then. So that's the first exciting thing. And then beyond that, the next thing that I really want to strongly put across to you is the idea that Selma used this opportunity to completely almost start again in terms of the, the technology, the acoustics and the aesthetics um, that we see on display in front of us here. So it's not just about the sound, but it's about the design. Um, so they're now incorporating a lot more technology for a start in the design process, so 3D modeling. Um, in terms of the machinery to make the saxophone, they're using much more automated control of the machining tools. And then a really exciting uh, new concept that I've heard about is that they are now using a 3D scanner to scan the saxophone at various points along the way during its manufacturing process. So they can completely check the consistency of the instrument, any little slips along the way. And if they're sort of at stage one, shall we say, and something isn't quite right, they can attend to it. Rather than test the saxophone at the end, realize there's an issue with it and just sell it with bugs and all, if you like, they can completely kind of control that process all the way throughout the manufacturing process. So that's a 3D scanning machine they utilize for that process. So I think that's a really uh, cool new aspect to it. 
But just kind of going back to the, the acoustic side of things, which really is the key thing that gives us this sound, um, there is so much going on and that we have to unpack that they've done in terms of changes in order to create this sound that I've mentioned. Um, I'm going to sort of take you through it step by step in terms of the, the individual acoustic changes. Um, but uh, it really has been a major overhaul on Selma's part. So that's the acoustics and then within the ergonomics as well. Again, a, a major overhaul in terms of the entire uh, key design. And the aesthetics, well, I'll come to that in a minute as well. Um, I mean, immediately you can see here a, a beautiful looking instrument. In summary, no stone has been unturned with this instrument. They have really attended to every detail. It's quite incredible. Okay, let's delve into a little bit more detail. First of all, in terms of the acoustics. So to start off with, at the top of the instrument, this is a completely newly designed neck bore. So obviously that's going to make a massive difference to the, the whole airflow and the way it sounds. Uh, this is the real business end of the saxophone, as we all know. They've also um, reduced the diameter of the low B flat and B keys. Um, so that will have an impact on the, the intonation you'd presume and on the way it responds. I think it can also have an effect on these uh, main stack notes as well because they all resonate through this lower tube here so I'm sure that is a, a crucial thing to take note of. They've also changed the key heights. I'm not exactly sure where that is but um, that's what's in the written spec anyway. Certainly feels great under the fingers. It doesn't feel like a too much of a high floppy action. It feels like it might just be a little tighter in certain places. Um, they have modified the diameters and locations of tone holes. So again, that's going to have an impact on the intonation if they've decided that certain things need to be moved ever so fractionally in order to tweak the intonation. This entire bore here on the bell has been redesigned. So if you like, this is new and this is new. There's no mention that there's been a change of bore on this central section here. So I somewhat suspect that this may be borrowed from one of their previous designs, but that is speculation on my part. Perhaps the reference would be my guess, but as I say, that is speculation. But it's certainly um, a, a massive um, change on Selma's part to completely redesign the bell and the neck. Um, that also, you'll see this from a visual standpoint right now, that this is a completely new clamp up here. I believe it's made from nickel silver. They describe it as a three-point concentric clamp. Um, and I suppose it was always a little bit more on the basic side with previous Selmers. Um, Yamaha do a great job of um, producing really nice key clamps and it's more in line with, with that sort of quality of, of top Yamaha designs now. Um, it looks great, it feels really great and solid that connection between the, the neck and the body. So I like that. There's also a direct arm between the right hand F and F sharp key. So the regulation there is tweaked somewhat. They've incorporated Teflon into the octave key mechanism here for a, a lighter, um, more fluid action. Um, they have also, and this is a big one that I really do properly understand myself as a sax player and has real relevance um, to the, to the um, performance side of things, but they've incorporated the C-sharp correction system which they utilised in the Series 3, um, whereby the middle C-sharp, um, you can just see it here, this C-sharp, this little extra valve here that allows the C-sharp just to ring through a little bit brighter in the middle octave. Um, and then as we go to the upper octave, that C sharp, uh, uh, the, the covering closes, so the top C sharp isn't sharp. So you get a beautifully in tune middle C sharp, and the top C sharp isn't ringing through sharp, which can happen on certain saxophones. Well, normally we consider that sort of idiosyncrasy that we just have to adjust to as saxophone players. You know, we lip down or we throat down on top C sharp, and we sort of feel like we have to push up on the middle C sharp. Um, no longer an issue with this instrument. So as I say, it's borrowed from the Series 3 concept, but they've also changed the position of it so that this correction mechanism is around the front here as opposed to more on the side, which is where it was on the Series 3. And I believe that also has um, some acoustical advantages. Certainly feels great to me anyway. I mean, the intonation um, around that C-sharp area is spot on for my money. Um, there's a new front F key design. You can see that, hopefully, from the camera angle there. Um, 
a lot of sax manufacturers work on this uh, F key to make sure that it's as ergonomically satisfactory as possible and certainly the case here with Selma that feels great as you uh, roll onto that F key so I really like that. Um, they have got some hinge toggle action going on here on the left hand table key so everything feels nice and smooth and accessible down here which is always nice. They have redesigned the placement and the shapes of the side keys. So you can obviously see here on the right hand side, there's a real slope off here. Just try and hold that to the camera. Can you see that dropping down from here to here? Um, feels really comfortable. Naturally, the B flat is nice and low. You're not going to knock that by accident. And then you everything kind of slopes upwards as you go to the to the C and then the, the top E there feels great under the fingers. I really love that. There's a shorter action on the C and the E flat keys here, so less travel, which is always good if you're trying to play fluidly. And then at the same time, and a crucial one for me, the octave key, um, the action is nice and short there. Again, less travel, and that's what you want. You don't want a great big kind of uh, floppy action as you're trying to access the octave key and get it to you know, hit the home point. It's just a, a little pivot and you've you've hit the base as it were so that's great and this f sharp key here i think i believe they've changed the position of this so that's more optimized again feels great i don't often use the side f sharp i have to say i think that just about summarizes all of the changes so uh deep breath that was a uh, quite a barrage of things to get through there but as you can see from that list of um, ergonomic changes they really have just not left any stone unturned, as I said before. It's quite incredible what they've achieved in terms of the mechanism, considering how good it was before. And the fact that they've now taken it to this level is quite some achievement. Okay, so on to the next aspect, the aesthetics. I've got less to say here because the instrument speaks for itself. First of all, just check out its beautiful dark gold lacquer. So I really love this color, this hue, if you like. And again, I think they're pointing back to some of their earlier models from the 40s onwards. Um, it's a little bit lighter than the modern reference Alto, I believe. Um, but at the same time, it's got that nice sort of deep gold appearance and looks similar to you know, some of those earlier classic models, balanced actions and so forth. So that's a, a lovely aspect. And then if we turn it round and look at this beautiful engraving here, I'll try and hold it still for the cameras. Well, it's just marvellous, isn't it? Um, it just looks like a floral explosion of activity here. There's even some metal molecules here, I've read here, these little cubes, they look wonderful. And, and apparently that's sort of referencing um, the, the construction of the, the instrument. I suppose the whole thing is made from metal, so it makes sense. Um, but uh, the, the whole concept um, has a sort of higher artistic uh, meaning according to the Selma designers, which I like. You might think it's a little bit flowery um, when you read their spec on what they say about the aesthetics or the engraving rather, um, but I like it and I think it looks great. Um, so just, oh yes, yeah, sorry, one final point actually on the aesthetics. I've talked about the engraving and the, and the lacquer, but I should also point out that they have modified various key guards to give this really um, beautiful, sleek look here. I think you'll agree. The design on these key guards here, you see that's a, that's a really nice sort of soft angle going on here, some lovely curves there, here on this key guard. Wherever you see a key guard, it's beautiful. Just look out, check this key guard here. Wonderful stuff. So it's a, a bit lighter Oh, this one here. This has changed as well. Cuts the weight down a little bit, but also just has this really sleek aesthetic. And if you didn't see it before, just going back to the engraving, look, continues all the way up the back here. Any little bit of space they've got their engraving in. So absolutely love that. I want just one other final point. I don't think I mentioned this before, but as I've got this turned around right now, you'll see a metal thumb rest here and you'll see a metal thumb rest here. None of this plastic stuff going on. And I just much prefer that. I just think if you're going to spend all this money on a saxophone, finish it off with metal thumb rests, you know, with a nice curve and a nice angle, something that doesn't cut into your, to your thumbs. And these feel absolutely great. So that's my final point on the aesthetics. But I suppose related to the aesthetics um, would be the way the whole instrument is presented to you as you 
unbox the saxophone. Now, I didn't do an unboxing at the beginning. I realized I played for you, but I'd like to do one for you right now. Will you just check out the beauty of this case? So Selma have partnered with BAM, another French company who make exquisite accessories and uh, beautiful cases. We stock those cases separately. And they have clearly worked on, as far as I'm concerned, one of their best case designs yet. I mean, just look at this before I open it up. I know I started to open it, but I want to show this to the camera. Just check out this blue here. In fact, the texture, even just when you run your finger up and down that, there's a certain uh, electricity to the, to the touch. Um, so I love this material. I don't know what it is, um, but the blue I've, I've been told is a sort of reference to the blue color that Selma use on their S shape on the neck. So they've got that going on. Uh, we've got this little triangulated pocket here. So we open it up and have a look, see what's inside. Just a piece of bubble wrap. But I, I believe there was something in there. I think I've removed it now. So we'll just tuck that back in there again. But I love that pocket. And then as we open it up, just check this out. We have a presentation microfiber cloth with the entire engraving demonstrated on it which is just a lovely touch. Quite often you open up a saxophone case and it comes in another kind of poly bag and it's just always fractionally disappointing when you have to get it out some kind of inferior bag once you've opened up the case. But in this case, you open it up and you present it with this. I think that's just a beautiful touch. So I shall fold that away, cast it aside for the time being. And then you can see the interior of the case beautifully designed by BAM again, and more accessories going on here. Yeah, there's a, another little um, kind of pocket there where you can, I'm sure there's some bits and pieces in there. Not quite sure, but you can certainly store whatever you need to in there. In this section here, we've got this perfectly shaped pouch, which again, you can put your neck strap in and all sorts. Well, there is the Selma neck strap and um, a Selma pull through. Again, I can see the engraving on that pull through when I start to peer around the corner. So I'm sure that is going to be beautiful. There's a cork grease in there. And there is a separate box actually that comes with it that I've not got here in this demo right now. A little box about this big, which has the concept mouthpiece, the ligature, uh, the cap and all of that sort of thing. Again, beautifully presented. Um, and the saxophone just fits snugly inside this case. So there we go. How about that for a presentation package? Just wonderful. And now I think it's time to get into playing the saxophone a little bit more. I know I played some at the beginning for you, but I just want to demonstrate more of the range of it and give you some contrasting tones and just really get into the sound of it. <laughs> So there we are. Now, in conclusion, I really think we've got something special going on with this sax. For me, there are no weak sound areas. Everything feels smooth as you transition through the different registers. And the intonation for me is absolutely perfect. Um, quite often you'll find with even high level alto saxophones and tenors, 
that there are little weak areas with the intonation where you cross over the break area and you just have to coax the sound a little bit. But Selma have really thought of everything here in terms of those little areas of the intonation. It's not just the tuning, but it's the sound that's so smooth as you transition through these areas. Uh, the sound doesn't pop out at you as you go into the bottom B, B flat area. It remains smooth with this kind of soft rounded edge. So I suppose in terms of describing the sound, it's got this fullness and this warmth to it and a, a, a light resistance that you'd always associate with a Selma sound. So you can hear it Selma straight away. It's got that trademark. Um, but for my money, in terms of the way it compares with um, its, the, the current uh, models that Selma offer, its peers if you like, uh, it's got a little bit more roundness and warmth to, for example, the reference, which I, for my money is the one that it's going to be compared to the most. Um, so it has got that reference-esque sound to it, um, that voluptuousness, that sort of openness and projection but it's just a little softer around the edges. So just taking it back a step to Selma's original brief of producing a universal saxophone that really spans across the genres from classical to jazz, etc. Have they produced a saxophone that can produce in all of those areas? I would say the answer is yes. There's enough flexibility in the sound whereby if you play in a certain way, the sound will follow you. And that's what you want a good saxophone to do. You know, if you try and, if you have in your mind a soft jazzy sound, the saxophone will follow you and play in that style. But if you want to sweeten it up and add some focus to it, the saxophone will also follow you. And I think that they've achieved that in the saxophone. So really quite a, a remarkable achievement considering what they were up against with trying to um, set about doing that. I mean, that is um, some agenda that they've set there. And just in terms of the way the whole thing plays. The, you, it's all very well saying, coming out with a list of ergonomics and saying they've done this, 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 and this, and that's 15 things they've done, isn't it wonderful? But in practice, does it have a real world effect? And in this case, it really does. It, the, the, the keys fit to my hands like a glove. It doesn't really take a, a sort of breaking in period of, oh, I need it for a couple of weeks just to get used to it. It just feels, completely natural to me um, and there's no play, there's no double action, just every little detail has been attended to. It's really what you describe as perfection in terms of the mechanism. The sound of course is a subjective thing and people will comment on this. For, for me it sounds absolutely wonderful, it's just what you want to hear in an alto sound. Um, it's got, as I say, that flexibility to span across uh, the different sound genres. So the combination of the, the beauty of the sound and this new ergonomic standard that Selma has set has really put this instrument, the Supreme, right at the top level of saxophone um, design. I'm very impressed with this. And as I said in one of my um, written features on the saxophone a few days back, I really think we should probably mark this date in history because you never know in 10, 20, 40, 50, 60 years time, we might all be talking about this new Supreme in the way that we now talk about the Mark VI. Who knows, but I'm just putting it out there. So there you go, guys. This, is, this concludes my presentation on the Supreme, an incredible new instrument from Selma Paris, and I thoroughly encourage you to come and try this sax. <laughs>